Book One of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Lee Bardugo. Shadow and Bone. Chapter Three. I woke with a start. I could feel the rush of air on my skin, and I opened my eyes to see what looked like dark clouds of smoke. I was on my back, on the deck of the skiff. It took me only a moment to realize that the clouds were getting thinner, giving way to dark wisps and, between them, a bright autumn sun. I closed my eyes again, feeling relief wash over me. We're on our way out of the fold, I thought. Somehow we made it through. Or had we? Memories of the Volcra attack flooded back to me in a frightening rush. Where was Mal? I tried to sit up and a bolt of pain shot through my shoulders. I ignored it and pushed myself up. I found myself looking down a rifle barrel. Get that thing away from me, I snapped, batting it aside. The soldier swung the rifle back around, jabbing it threateningly at me. Stay where you are, he commanded. I stared at him, stunned. What's wrong with you? She's awake, he shouted over his shoulder. He was joined by two more armed soldiers, the captain of the skiff, and a corporal neck. With a thrum of panic, I saw that the cuffs of her kefta were embroidered in black. What did a heart render want with me? I looked around. A squalor still stood by the mast. I looked around. A squalor still stood by the mast, arms raised, driving us forward on a strong wind, a single soldier by his side. The deck was slick with blood in places. My stomach turned as I remembered the horror of the battle. A corporal healer was tending to the wounded. Where was Mao? There were soldiers and Grisha standing by the railings, bloodied, singed, and considerably fewer in number than when we had set out. They were all watching me warily. With growing fear, I realized that the soldiers in the corporal neck were actually guarding me, like a prisoner. I said, Maloretsev, he's a tracker. He was injured during the attack. Where is he? No one said anything. Please, I begged. Where is he? There was a jolt as the skiff came aground. The captain gestured at me with his rifle. Up. I thought about simply refusing to get up until they told me what had happened to Mal, but a glance at the heart render made me reconsider. I got to my feet, wincing at the pain in my shoulder, then I stumbled as the skiff started to move again, pulled forward by the dry dock workers on land. Instinctively, I reached out to steady myself, but the soldier I touched shrank back from me as if I burned. I managed to find my footing, but my thoughts were reeling. The skiff halted again. Move, the captain commanded. The soldiers led me at rifle point from the skiff. I passed the other survivors, acutely aware of their curious and frightened stares, and caught sight of the senior cartographer babbling excitedly to a soldier. I wanted to stop to tell him what had happened to Alexei, but I didn't care. As I stepped onto the dry dock, I was surprised to see that we were back in Krivisk. We hadn't even made it across the fold. I shuddered. Better to be marching through camp with a rifle at my back than to be on the unsea. But not much better, I thought anxiously. As the soldiers marched me up the main road, people turned from their work to gawk. My mind was whirring, searching for answers and finding nothing. Had I done something wrong in the fold? Broken some kind of military protocol? And how had we gotten out of the fold, anyway? The wounds near my shoulder throbbed. The last thing I remembered was the terrible pain of the Volker's claws piercing my back, that searing burst of light. How had we survived? These thoughts were driven from my mind as we approached the officer's tent. The captain called the guards to a halt and stepped towards the entrance. The Corporal Nick reached out a hand to stop him. This is a waste of time. We should proceed immediately to. Take your hand off me, bloodletter. The captain snapped and shook his arm free. For a moment, the Corporal Nick stared at him, her eyes dangerous. Then she smiled coldly and bowed. Da, Capitan. I felt the hair on my arms rise. The captain disappeared inside the tent. We waited. I glanced nervously at the Corporal Nick, who had apparently forgotten her feud with the captain and was scrutinizing me once again. She was young, maybe even younger than I was, but that hadn't stopped her from confronting a superior officer. Why would it? She could kill the captain where he stood without ever raising a weapon. I rubbed my arms, trying to shake the chill that had settled over me. The tent flap opened, and I was horrified to see the captain emerge, followed by a stern Colonel Rafsky. What could I have possibly done that would require the involvement of a senior officer? The colonel peered at me, his weathered face grim. What are you? Assistant Cartographer Alina Starkov, Royal Corps of Surveyors. He cut me off. What are you? I blinked. I'm, I'm a map maker, sir. Ravsky scowled. He pulled one of the soldiers aside and muttered something to him that sent the soldier sprinting back towards the dry docks. Let's go, he said tersely. I felt the jab of a rifle barrel in my back and marched forward. I had a very bad feeling about where I was being taken. It can't be, I thought desperately. It makes no sense. But as the huge black tent loomed larger and larger before us, there could be no doubt about where we were headed. The entrance to the Grisha tent was guarded by Morocco Paraki heartrenders and charcoal-clad Opraniki, the elite soldiers who made up the Darkling's personal guard. The Opraniki weren't Grisha, but they were just as frightening. 
The corporal neck from the skiff conferred with the guards at the front of the tent, then she and Colonel Ravsky disappeared inside. I waited, my heart racing, aware of the whispers and stares behind me, my anxiety rising. High above, four flags fluttered in the breeze, blue, red, purple, and above them all, black. Just last night, Mal and his friends had been laughing about trying to get into this tent, wondering what they might find inside. And now it seemed I would be the one to find out. Where is Mal? The thought kept returning to me, the only clear thought I seemed to be able to form. After what seems an eternity, the corporal neck returned and nodded at the captain, who led me into the Grisha tent. For a moment, all my fear disappeared, eclipsed by the beauty that surrounded me. The tent's inner walls were draped with cascades of bronze silk that caught the glimmering candlelight from chandeliers sparkling high above. The floors were covered in rich rugs and furs. Along the walls, shimmering silken partitions separated compartments where Grisha clustered in their vibrant kefta. Some stood talking, others lounged on cushions drinking tea. Two were bent over a game of chess. From somewhere, I heard the strings of a bolalaika being plucked. The Duke's estate had been beautiful, but it was the melancholy beauty of dusty rooms and peeling paint, the echo of something that had once been grand. The Grisha tent was like nothing I had ever seen before, a place alive with power and wealth. The soldiers marched me down a long carpeted aisle at the end of which I could see a black pavilion on a raised dais. A ripple of curiosity spread through the tent as we passed. Grecian men and women stopped their conversations to gape at me. A few even rose to get a better look. By the time we reached the dais, the room was all but silent, and I felt sure that everyone must hear my heart hammering in my chest. In front of the black pavilion, a few richly attired ministers wearing the king's double eagle and a group of Corporal Rocky clustered around a long table spread with maps. At the head of the table was an ornately carved, high-backed chair of blackest ebony, and upon it lounged a figure in a black kefta, his chin resting on one pale hand. Only one Grisha wore black, was permitted to wear black. Colonel Ravsky stood beside him, speaking in tones far too low for me to hear. I stared, torn between fear and fascination. He's too young, I thought. This darkling had been commanding the Grisha since before I was born, but the man seated above me on the dais didn't look much older than I did. He had a sharp, beautiful face, a shock of thick black hair, and clear gray eyes that glimmered like quartz. I knew that the more powerful Grisha were said to live long lives, and Darklings were the most powerful of them all. But I felt the wrongness of it, and I remembered Eva's words. He's not natural. None of them are. A high, tinkling laugh sounded from the crowd that had formed near me at the base of the dais. I recognized the beautiful girl in blue, the one from the Ferialki coach who had been so taken with Mal. She whispered something to her chestnut-haired friend, and they both laughed again. My cheeks burned as I imagined what I must look like in a torn shabby coat after a long journey into the shadow fold and a battle with a flock of hungry Volcra. But I lifted my chin and I looked at the beautiful girl right in the eye. Laugh all you want, I thought grimly. Whatever you're whispering, I've heard worse. She held my gaze for a moment and then looked away. I enjoyed a brief flash of satisfaction before Colonel Refsky's voice brought me back to the reality of my situation. Bring them, he said. I turned to see more soldiers leading a battered and bewildered group of people into the tent and up the aisle. Among them, I spotted the soldier who had been beside me when the Volcra attacked and the senior cartographer, his usually tidy coat worn and dirty, his face frightened. My distress grew as I realized that they were the survivors from my sand skiff and that they had been brought before the Darkling as witnesses. What had happened out there in the fold? What did they think I had done? My breath caught as I recognized the trackers in the group. I saw Mikhail first, his shaggy red hair bobbing above the crowd, on his thick neck and leaning on him, bandages peeking out from his bloodied shirt, was a very pale, very tired-looking Mal. My legs went weak and I pressed my hand to my mouth to stifle a sob. Mal was alive. I wanted to push through the crowd and throw my arms around him, but it was all I could do to stay standing as relief flooded through me. Whatever happened here, we would be alright. We had survived the fold and we would survive this madness too. I looked back at the dais and my elation withered. The darkling was looking directly at me. He was still listening to Colonel Ravsky, his posture just as relaxed as it had been before, but his gaze was focused, intent. He turned his attention back to the colonel, and I realized that I had been holding my breath. When the bedraggled group of survivors reached the base of the dais, Colonel Ravsky ordered, Capitan, report. The captain stood at attention and answered in an expressionless voice. Approximately thirty minutes into the crossing, we were set upon by a large flock of Volcra. We were pinned down and sustaining heavy casualties. I was fighting on the starboard side of the skiff. At that point, I saw. The soldier hesitated, and when he spoke again, his voice sounded less sure. I don't know exactly what I saw. A blaze of light, bright as noon, brighter, like staring into the sun. The crowd erupted into murmurs. The survivors from the skiff were nodding, and I found myself nodding along with them. I had seen the blaze of light, too. The soldier snapped back to attention and continued. 
The bulk was scattered and the light disappeared. I ordered us back to dry dock immediately. And the girl? asked the darkling. With a cold stab of fear, I realized he was talking about me. I didn't see the girl, Mont Savonier. The darkling raised an eyebrow, turning to the other survivors. Who actually saw what happened? His voice was cool, distant, almost disinterested. The survivors broke into muttered discussion with one another. Then slowly, timidly, the senior cartographer stepped forward. I felt a keen twinge of pity for him. I'd never seen him so disheveled. His sparse brown hair was standing at all angles on his head, his fingers plucked nervously at his ruined coat. Tell us what you saw, said Ravsky. The cartographer licked his lips. We, we were under attack, he said tremulously. There was fighting all around, such noise, so much blood. One of the boys, Alexei, was taken. It was terrible, terrible. His hands fluttered like two startled birds. I frowned. If the cartographer had seen Alexei attacked, then why hadn't he tried to help? The old man cleared his throat. They were everywhere. I saw one go after her. Who? said Ravsky. Alina. Alina Starkov, one of my assistants. The beautiful girl in blue smirked and leaned over to whisper to her friend. I clenched my jaw. How nice to know that the Grisha could still maintain their snobbery in the midst of hearing about a Volkra attack. Go on, Ravsky pressed. I saw one go after her in the tracker, the cartographer said, gesturing to Mal. And where were you? I asked angrily. The question was out of my mouth before I could think better of it. Every face turned to look at me, but I didn't care. You saw the Volker attack us. You saw that thing take Alexei. Why didn't you help? There was nothing I could do, he pleaded. His hands spread wide. They were everywhere. It was chaos. Alexei might still be alive if you'd gotten off your bony ass to help us. There was a gasp and a burble of laughter from the crowd. The cartographer flushed angrily and I felt instantly sorry. If I got out of this mess, I was going to be in very big trouble. Enough, boomed Drowski. Tell us what you saw, cartographer. The crowd hushed and the cartographer licked his lips again. The tracker went down. She was beside him. That thing, the Volcro, was coming at them. I saw it on top of her and then... She lit up. The Grisha erupted into exclamations of disbelief and derision. A few of them laughed. If I hadn't been so scared and baffled, I might have been tempted to join them. Maybe I shouldn't have been so hard on him, I thought, looking at the poor rumpled cartographer. The poor man clearly took a bump to the head during the attack. I saw it, he shouted over the den. Light came out of her. Some of the Grisha were jeering openly now, but the others were yelling, let him speak. The cartographer looked desperately to his fellow survivors for support. And to my amazement, I saw some of them nod. Had everyone gone mad? Did they actually think I'd chased off the Volcra? This is absurd, said a voice from the crowd. It was the beautiful girl in blue. What are you suggesting, old man, that you found us a sun summoner? I'm not suggesting anything, he protested. I'm only telling what I saw. It's not impossible, said a heavyset Grisha. He wore the purple capta of Material Nick, a member of the Order of Fabricators. There are stories. Don't be ridiculous, the girl laughed, her voice thick with scorn. The man's had his wits rattled by the Volcra. The crowd erupted into a loud argument. I suddenly felt very tired. My shoulder throbbed where the Volcra had dung its talons into me. I didn't know what the cartographer or any of the others on the skiff thought they had seen. I just knew that this was all some kind of terrible mistake, and at the end of this farce, I would be the one looking foolish. I cringed when I thought of the teasing I would take when this was over, and hopefully it would be over soon. Quiet, the darkling barely seemed to raise his voice, but the command sliced through the crowd and silence fell. I suppressed a shiver. He might not find this joke so funny. I just hoped he wouldn't blame me for it. The darkling wasn't known for mercy. Maybe I should be worrying less about being teased and more about being exiled to Sibia, or worse. Eva said that the Darkling had once ordered a Korporaki healer to seal a traitor's mouth shut permanently. The man's lips had been grafted together and he had starved to death. At the time, Alexei and I had laughed and dismissed it as another of Eva's crazy stories. Now I wasn't so sure. Tracker, the Darkling said softly. What did you see? As one, the crowd turned toward Mal, who looked uneasily at me and then back at the Darkling. Nothing. I didn't see anything. The girl was right beside you. Mal nodded. You must have seen something. Mal glanced at me again, his look weighted with worry and fatigue. I'd never seen him so pale, and I wondered how much blood he had lost. I felt a surge of helpless anger. He was badly hurt. He should be resting instead of standing here answering ridiculous questions. Just tell us what you remember, Tracker, commanded Ravsky. Mal shrugged slightly and winced at the pain from his wounds. I was on my back on the deck. Alina was next to me. I saw the Volcra diving, and I knew it was coming for us. I said something, and... What did you say? The Darkling's cool voice cut through the room. I don't remember, Mal said. I recognized the stubborn set of his jaw and knew he was lying. He did remember. I smelled the Volcra, saw it swooping down on us. Alina screamed, and then I couldn't see anything. The world was just... shining. 
So you didn't see where the light was coming from? Ravsky asked. Alina isn't... She couldn't... Mal shook his head. We're from the same village. I noticed that tiny pause, the orphan's pause. If she could do anything like that, I would know. The Darkling looked at Mal for a long moment and then glanced back at me. We all have our secrets, he said. Mal opened his mouth as if to say more, but the Darkling put up a hand to silence him. Anger flashed across Mal's features, but he shut his mouth, his lips pressed into a grim line. The Darkling rose from his chair. He gestured, and the soldier stepped back, leaving me alone to face him. The tent seemed eerily silent. Slowly, he descended the steps. I had to fight the urge to back away from him as he came to a halt in front of me. Now what do you say, Alina Starkov? he asked pleasantly. I swallowed. My throat was dry and my heart was careening from beat to beat, but I knew I had to speak. I had to make him understand that I had no part in any of this. There's been some kind of mistake, I said hoarsely. I didn't do anything. I don't know how we survived. The Darkling appeared to consider this. Then he crossed his arms, cocked his head to one side. Well, he said, his voice bemused. I'd like to think that I know everything that happens in Ravka, and that if I had a sun summoner living in my own country, I'd be aware of it. Soft murmurs of assent rose from the crowd, but he ignored them, watching me closely. But something powerful stopped the Volkra and saved the king's skiffs. He paused and waited as if he expected me to solve this conundrum for him. My chin rose stubbornly. I didn't do anything, I said, not one thing. The side of the Darkling's mouth twitched as if he were repressing a smile. His eyes slid over me from head to toe and back again. I felt like something strange and shiny, a curiosity that had washed up on a lake shore that he might kick aside with his boot. Is your memory as faulty as your friend's, he asked and bobbed his head towards Mal. I don't, I faltered. What did I remember? Terror, darkness, pain, Mal's blood, his life flowing out of him beneath my hands, the rage that filled me at the thought of my own helplessness. Hold out your arm, said the Darkling. What? We've wasted enough time. Hold out your arm. A cold spike of fear went through me. I looked around in panic, but there was no help to be had. The soldiers stared forward, stone-faced. The survivors from the skiff looked frightened and tired. The Grisha regarded me curiously. The girl in blue was smirking. Mal's pale face seemed to have gone even whiter, but there was no answer in his worried eyes. Shaking, I held out my left arm. Push up your sleeve. I didn't do anything. I'd meant to say it loudly to proclaim it, but my voice sounded frightened and small. The Darkling looked at me, waiting. I pushed up my sleeve. He spread his arms and terror washed through me as I saw his palms filling up with something black that pulled and curled through the air like ink and water. Now, he said in the same soft conversational voice, as if we were sitting together drinking tea, as if I did not stand before him shaking, let's see what you can do. He brought his hands together and there was a sound like a thunderclap. I gasped as undulating darkness spread from his clasped hands, spilling in a black wave over me in the crowd. I was blind. The room was gone. Everything was gone. I cried out in terror as I felt the Darkling's fingers close around my bare wrist. Suddenly, my fear receded. It was still there, cringing like an animal inside me, but it had been pushed aside by something calm and sure and powerful, something vaguely familiar. I felt a call ring through me and, to my surprise, I felt something in me rise up to answer. I pushed it away, pushed it down. Somehow I knew that if it... Somehow I knew that if it... Somehow I knew that if that thing got free, it would destroy me. Nothing there, the Darkling murmured. I realized how very close he was to me in the dark. My panicked mind seized on his words. Nothing there, that's right, nothing, nothing at all. Now leave me be. And to my relief, that struggling thing inside me seemed to lie back down, leaving the Darkling's call unanswered. Not so fast, he whispered. I felt something cold press against the inside of my forearm. In the same moment that I realized it was a knife, the blade cut into my skin. Pain and fear rushed through me. I cried out. The thing inside me roared to the surface, speeding towards the Darkling's call. I couldn't stop myself. I answered. The world exploded into blazing white light. The darkness shattered around us like glass. For a moment, I saw the faces of the crowd, their mouths wide with shock as the tent filled with shining sunlight, the air shimmering with heat. Then the Darkling released his grip, and with his touch went that peculiar sense of certainty that had possessed me. The radiant light disappeared, leaving ordinary candlelight in its place, but I could still feel the warm and inexplicable glow of sunshine on my skin. My legs gave way and the Darkling caught me up against his body with one surprisingly strong arm. I guess you only look like a mouse, he whispered in my ear, and then beckoned to one of his personal guard. Take her, he said, handing me over to the Oprichnik, who reached out his arm to support me. I felt myself flush at the indignity of being handed over like a sack of potatoes, but I was too shaky and confused to protest. Blood was running down my arm from the cut the Darkling had given me. 
Ivan, shouted the Darkling. A tall heart render rushed from the dais to the Darkling's side. Get her to my coach. I want her surrounded by an armed guard at all times. Take her to the little palace and stop for nothing. Ivan nodded. And bring a healer to see to her wounds. Wait, I protested. But the Darkling was already turning away. I grabbed hold of his arm, ignoring the gasp that rose from the Grisha onlookers. There's been some kind of mistake. I don't. I'm not. My voice trailed off as the Darkling turned slowly to me, his slate eyes drifting to where my hand gripped his sleeve. I let go, but I wasn't giving up that easily. It's not what you... I'm not what you think I am, I whispered desperately. The Darkling stepped closer to me and said, his voice so low that only I could hear, I doubt you have any idea what you are. Then he nodded to Ivan. Go. The Darkling turned his back on me and walked swiftly towards the raised dais where he was swarmed by advisors and ministers all talking loudly and rapidly. Ivan grabbed me roughly by the arm. Come on. Ivan, called the Darkling. Mind your tone. She is Grecian now. Ivan reddened slightly and gave a small bow, but his grip on my arm didn't slacken as he pulled me down the aisle. You have to listen to me, I gasped as I struggled to keep up with his long strides. I'm not Grecia. I'm a map maker. I'm not even a very good map maker. Ivan ignored me. I looked back over my shoulder, searching the crowd. Mal was arguing with the captain from the sand skiff. As if he felt my eyes on him, he looked up and met my gaze. I could see my own panic and confusion mirrored in his white face. I wanted to cry out to him, to run to him, but the next moment he was gone, swallowed up by the crowd.